Well, the title today kind of says it all. Did COVID-19 rock your technical world? Um, and don't let it happen again. I think many businesses, well, I would say almost every business was affected in some way, shape or form by the pandemic. COVID-19 was obviously unforeseen, uh, has been chaotic, crazy. And so many businesses were affected because for lack of better terms, their technology just was not ready uh, for the hit that was COVID-19. Uh, you know, and uh, managing a business as hard as it is, but then keeping up with what your individual market is demanding of you as far as change goes. You know, think about restaurants forever ago, it was menus, now it's all digital menus, digital beer screens. And, you know, they've had to adjust and innovate, evolve to keep up with their customer demands. Um, but what we're seeing now in the world is technology is changing fast and it's forcing you as a business owner to think and look at your business differently. But here's the problem I have with this title, with this presentation is, Technology is huge. It's a huge topic, and there's so many facets to it. So, <clears throat> in the next, you know, 50 minutes, I we can't teach you everything that you need to know about technology in your business in order to make these decisions correctly for the future. I can't teach you how to get your certifications. I can't teach you security. I can't teach you budgeting and planning. I can't teach all that. But what we can uh, show you is the solution that you can get your hands on, which is finding an IT professional or a managed services provider who can partner with you, uh, who has all these capabilities built into their service offering to guide you as a business owner into not having your technical world rocked in the future if an unforeseen event like COVID-19 ever happens again. So that's the goal today is, is to really talk through how to find a partner, what to look for, what questions to ask, what red flags to look out for. And so that at the end of this, if you're operating a small business or planning to start a small business, and you need technology services, you'll know how to go and get them to be prepared for the future. Um, as I mentioned early on, we'll leave about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for a little question and answer time. Um, and again, my name is Luke Barton. I'm the business development director here at 360. I'm joined by Brian Reeves, our technical business advisor. And he really does a lot of the stuff we're gonna talk about with our clients. Uh, and then Justin Carter, who's our chief technology officer and one of our partners here at the business. So let's dive into uh, who we are just briefly, 360 IT partner. We've been in business since 1995. We're old, we're graying, we're balding, um, but we've, we've learned a lot along the way. So we've got some experience and collective experience to draw from. And we serve the entire uh, coastal area of Virginia. Uh, we're located in the heart of Virginia Beach. Um, and also many of our clients have uh, locations all throughout the country and even the world. In fact, over the weekend, I was talking to uh, one of our team members, helping him dial out to Greece because we had a client in Greece that needed assistance. Um, and we exist simply because as a business owner, you face all kinds of frustrations. And when your IT isn't working, it's one of the biggest ones. And so our goal is to work with clients, develop a relationship, trust, help them build a success roadmap. And uh, when you have that plan in place, you can really focus on growing your business, growing your people and your revenues, and let us uh, take care of those tech issues for you. Uh, it's really an honor to do what we do. Uh, we're part of a community here. Uh, everybody takes care of everybody. And when you see the, the way that you and your work fits into that bigger picture of community, it really gives you a, a great sense of honor and pride. Um, so we're going to dive into the, the, the first and foremost uh, important thing to understand is, is what is an IT professional and why are they important? And I don't think of anybody better to answer this than Justin. Love it. So, you know, when we talk about an IT professional, uh, what, what I want to start with is, is what is not an IT professional? Um, you know, an IT professional is not, you know, your friend's roommate, you know, who builds his own computers. It's not uh, you, your neighbor who plays a lot of computer games. Uh, it's not a person who does computers, you know, as a side gig. Um, you know, this is somebody who is trained to support businesses, who has experience setting up business networks, uh, which are a lot different than home networks. Uh, a lot of people uh, that, that set up a small business computer network uh, need to know the same things that an enterprise IT environment uh, needs, and the same skill set. Um, and so it's important to be able to identify, you know, what is an IT professional and what's the difference between somebody who's, who's maybe a hobbyist or, or maybe learning, maybe beginning to somebody who, who is a professional. Um, and oftentimes when we get called in, nobody ever calls us and says, Hey, everything's working great. Come take over the network. Uh, so, you know, oftentimes we're coming behind 
someone, uh, you know, people are hiring us or a company like us to come in and fix things maybe that have been set up by somebody with, with less experience. Um, and just, of course, I don't, I say that with no ego at all. Um, it's just that, you know, you're better off going with somebody that knows what they're doing right out of the gate, hiring that professional uh, to save you those costs in the long term of having to redo any setups. And there's a cost, not just monetary, but time and getting things reconfigured and, you know, what's your time worth? So if you get it right, done right the first time, you don't have to go back and mess with it again. You know, and Justin, I think it's safe to say too, um, you, know, you know, part of our goal here is kind of inform and educate um, and, and also really just, you know, make the audience aware of some of the pitfalls, as you mentioned, um, some of the great questions to ask uh, and avoid those, those mistakes that we've kind of seen and, and hopefully um, help, help everyone out there make the right decision. This is like the Angie's list of IT <laughs> discussions here. So we're, we're going to help you find uh, the, the right thing. But it's an important conversation to have because it's not typically had. Um, and so, you know, when you're looking for help, what are your options? There's a thousand options. There's tens of thousands of options out there. Um, but, you know, common are going to be when you have a larger, you know, business is to hire a full-time staff person. Well, when's the last time you hired an IT person? You know, hiring salespeople, marketing folks, uh, customer support, administrative, purchasing, you know, payroll, accounts receivable. Those are all pretty self-explanatory tasks because they're so common in every single business. But when it comes to IT, there's so many things to think about. What are your business applications? Where are you guys in life cycle? Uh, what kind of things do you need to be innovating? How do you know you're hiring the right IT person that can do all the things that you need done? That's a big task. How are you going to write their job KPIs? How are you going to write their description? How do you know what to compensate them at? How do you know how to help them continue their education? So there's a lot that goes into that. So that could be one of those pitfalls where if you're thinking about hiring a person, maybe step back and consider that that might not be the best way. Um, you could hire a part-time person. You could go to a local computer shop and uh, you know, if your laptop's broken, hey, my screen is blue, I need it to be green, uh, get it fixed. You know, that's what we call break fix. Um, or you could hire a managed services provider. And so that's what we're really gonna focus on today is that when you're hiring a managed provider, you know, how is that applicable to your business? Uh, and that's probably going to be most applicable to most of you guys uh, today that have a business that are looking for technology support uh, and you're a small business. So from a, you know, what would one person's salary versus the cost of managed services be? Uh, managed services is probably going to be the more logical, cost effective, as well as beneficial option uh, for most of you dialed in today. Um, so uh, going to the next slide, if you would, Brian. Uh, I've probably heard Justin Carter express this. If I had a dollar for every time, I'd be a rich man. But what is a managed services provider? Yeah. So a uh, managed services provider, or an MSP, you know, is a term I don't even like really, but it's what our industry is called. Uh, but what does that even mean, a managed services provider? It's just a big, ugly term. Um, you know, and I like to say it's, it's a snowflake. You know, everybody's definition of what managed services is, is a little bit different. But in the context of our conversation today, we're going to talk about companies that outsource the function of the IT department. You know, what we call our service is the IT department as a service or IT DAS. Um, but, but essentially a managed service provider outsources the function of an IT department and prevents you from having to hire a help desk person a uh, compliance person, a CIO, a CTO, you know, again, we're, we're, ta we're targeting those businesses with, you know, five to, you know, 500 employees and uh, th that don't have the budget to hire five people to do their IT that have that breadth of knowledge that Luke was talking about. You know, how do you identify somebody that understands your regulatory compliance needs that, that also can fix your laptop screen, that can also um, you know, respond to you after hours, can also do your office move projects, can also have skills in project management and interfacing with, uh, with your vendors and representing you, you know, to your vendors. You know, it's a lot for one person. And, and, and I would dare say that it's rare to find one or two people that can have that entire breadth of knowledge. So a managed service provider provides that entire stack of technology solutions or services uh, of, of staffing to a, to a small business or to a business uh, and, and that's really the best way to define it is the IT department as a service. And it's the stack of technology providers within a small business. One thing that's important to note is unlike construction or finance uh, in IT, there is no regular regulatory body that says to be an IT provider, you must do it this way or this standard. <clears throat> so that's what really kind of creates 
the variety that you see out there is the fact that everybody delivering this service is delivering it according to the way that they see fit. So you're getting their maturity level, their experience, their professionalism, their standards, their processes. So that's why it's important to ask these questions because you as the consumer of these services are going to determine which services you get by how much you dig into what you're actually buying. So not just what's on paper, but what you're actually buying as a service and who you're buying, the team behind that service. So really important to note, it's not regulated. Yeah, and the, the operational maturity level uh, between managed service providers is wildly different because as Luke just said, there's no regulatory body that says you must meet these standards in order to provide the service like you would with a contractor of your home that has to meet certain building codes and things like that. Um, there's, it's unregulated. So uh, it's important to be able to identify you know, what, a, what a good offering from a managed service provider is. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I think that's a great segue kind of into the next couple of slides where we're going to talk about operational maturity and, and you know, what are the typical offerings from a provider? Um, and then how do I know that we selected an, an excellent provider or, mm -hmm. or what we call world class? You know, what sets the, the uh, you know, the great from the, you know, the average, the, the average yeah. exactly. Well, um, a, good, a good analogy as you go into this next slide is, you know, when you think about regulated versus unregulated, think about a roofing contractor. If you just find some guy that knows how to drive a nail into a shingle, you might end up with a roof on your house. But is that roof going to be hurricane rated up to 130 miles an hour? Is it going to have a warranty? Uh, you know, is it going to really be done right? Or are you going to end up paying more later when that unregulated work that wasn't done right shows its, its ugly head and causes you a big expensive headache later on. So that's really the difference is, are they doing it the right way? Are they thinking through it? And are they protecting you for the long term? All right, so so these are some of the, the typical offerings. Um, so <clears throat> as you're looking at different providers, you know, I kind of want to arm you with you know, some definitions um, and, and then some things that a, a, a typical uh, provider would use. Um, so the first thing, you know, when it kind of comes to cost, there's there's a couple different terminologies that are used, and uh, you heard Justin mention it earlier. You know, a monthly recurring fee. Um, that's typically, you know, all the services that are wrapped up um, in a monthly cost um, to you. Uh, and then there's also, you know, an additional um, or you know what they call a one-time fee. Um, that may apply to implementing some sort of new technology. Uh, and we're going to talk about you know, the different uh, roles and responsibilities that a mature MSP would have. And, and that's kind of one of them is, is what we would call a professional services uh, department that would implement new technology. Um, so from a cost perspective, you kind of have this monthly cost and this you know, single time cost. Um, secondly, um, proactive versus reactive service. So how, how many of you guys have heard of Murphy's Law? Um, yeah, uh, if something can go wrong, it, it will. will go wrong. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, and so, you know, we have this thing called reactive service, which a reactive service is, is anything that's unplanned, right? So my computer breaks, uh, I wasn't expecting it to happen, or my internet goes out, um, you know, that's an unplanned uh, global unsp bug that sends everybody working from home for an entire year. <laughs> Definitely not planned. Yeah. So, so by definition, a, a unscheduled event is is reactive. Conversely, a proactive is a planned event. Um, so things like Windows updates, right? We want to schedule maintenance time or we're going to install a piece of uh, hardware or software. That, that, those are things that can be scheduled and are therefore planned. Um, so, so the goal here is really to weight things more on the proactive side. Um, so kind of getting back to Murphy's Law, um, you know, I, I love how you know, Dave Ramsey talks about uh, financial fitness. Uh, and in, in uh, one of his descriptions, you know, at, at the beginning of his career, uh, shortly after he had to declare bankruptcy, um, his, his heating and air conditioning or his air conditioning unit, you know, went out in the middle of summertime. And it was this huge ordeal, um, you know, and we were kind of talking about, uh, you know, man, all of a sudden now you have to scrape up the money. Like, where, where is this going to come from? How do I know that I'm going to get a, a good HVAC guy? 
Um, it's it's this huge headache, and, and, and Murphy tends to show up uh, in the house when we're not expecting him to show up. Um, so that's kind of our reactive side, right? Um, later on, you know, after, you know, Dave and his wife had, you know, implemented the, the correct strategies, their water heater come, goes out. Uh, and it wasn't such of a big nuisance. It was more of a minor inconvenience because, you know, the right things have been set up uh, and the right strategies were in place uh, to help overcome that obstacle. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that we, we kick Murphy out. Uh, but we reduce the risk. We, we plan for that as much as possible. And, and so we've changed this huge frustrating ordeal into, you know, this, this minor inconvenience. Um, does that kind of make sense, everybody? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. The ship sinking isn't such a big deal if you have ample lifeboats. Yeah. So, you know, what we want to do is place that intense focus on, you know, proactive services. So those are things we want to look at. Um, so what are typically included in a monthly recurring uh, fee. Uh, there's some sort of a management tool set um, that will allow the provider to remotely you know, get into your computer and administer that computer. Um, there are vendor management, so they'll be able to talk to your software vendors and, and make sure that your technology is aligning you know, with the other vendor software. Um, after hour support, you know, what happens when it's after five o'clock? Is there some sort of support mechanism for you? Um, on-site support, man, what if I need somebody to come on site, you know, to, to swap this out or, you know, fix this widget? Um, how are we gonna accomplish that? Uh, and then of course, automated services. Um, things that are happening in the background, some, some basic maintenance items. Uh, those are all typical um, service offerings. Again, the goal is just to, to really reduce any sort of you know, significant negative impact. Um, so now that we've kind of defined what is a managed services provider and what kind of services they typically offer, like how do I know what I'm getting a, a good deal on? How do I, how, what do I see value? How do I differentiate uh, from these different providers? Uh, and I think earlier when we were, you know, talking Luke, I was thinking of that book, you know, from good to great. Yeah. Uh, how do I know if I have a good provider or an average provider? How do I know that I have a great or a world-class well, provider? There, there's normally a simple delineation and it's what most people probably wouldn't think, but it's actually price. Uh, you know, the, the old adage of, you know, price is what you pay, value is what you get. A really good indication of value in managed services, like that last slide was talking about, you know, all of these things that are typically included in a managed services offering. And that is the reality. Those are very average things that are typically included and they're normally coming at, you know, a certain price. But when you get into uh, a provider that's going to be world class, the next level up, you should expect to see a different price point. But in that additional price point, you should see different things. And that's what this anatomy we're going to talk about is, is those added areas of value that are baked into that service offering. Yeah, absolutely. And we've already kind of touched on those. It's like operational efficiency, you know, business planning. Um, you know, we want that provider to be outcome focused, you know, so they really, um, you know, the, the goal is to, to really have that provider understand your business and how technology impacts your business. Um, you know, as we said, this is, IT isn't something that's regulated. Um, and so, you know, anytime we implement some sort of technology, I mean, we can implement a whole bunch of things, but, but is it cost effective for you? Right. Is it right? For Will it your change business? your life? Right. That's like, you know, Jeff Bezos, right? Like we want to invest in life changing things. Uh, and, and IT can be one of them. Um, so a world-class uh, MSP should be, they should be leading you in technology, not the other way around. You know, um, hopefully you're not asking questions to your provider like, hey, I saw this out uh, on the news. What do you think about this? You know, um, oh my goodness, I noticed a big breach. Uh, hey guys, are we, are we safe? Um, the, the provider should be leading you in that endeavor. Uh, and that's how you can kind of tell that you, you're working with a, a great MSP. They should have processes and procedures in place. 
Um, so, so it should be a very mature process driven organization that provides consistent results. Um, so we, we know that, you know, we live in an imperfect world and things are going to go wrong and, and, and bad things are going to happen. Um, but over time, we should have consistent results, uh, consistent successful results. That's probably a better way of saying yeah. it, right? Um, if you have consistent negative results, maybe you have an average. Of SP. That's normally when we get the phone call uh, to, to change things up. But uh, yeah, it's a good point. Right? Yeah. Yeah, ahead, separate Justin. roles and responsibilities. I mean, that's one, you know, a, a lot of MSPs that are maybe smaller uh, don't have the resources uh, in order to have separate roles. So you've got employees that are wearing multiple hats that are doing many different things, which, which, you know, as we all know, once you start to have, you know, more and more things on your plate, you know, the quality of your work, you know, goes down. So, uh, you know, having people in separate dedicated roles and defining those roles uh, is really important. And it's something that we see lacking in a lot of maybe the smaller MSPs out there is all the employees are kind of uh, playing multiple roles and wearing multiple hats and having having people dedicated is, is a huge advantage. Yeah. How many times have you asked somebody, how's business going? And their first response is, ah, oh, so busy, so busy. And they wear that like a badge of honor. But as when it comes to delivering service, you don't want your MSP to be so busy that they can only reply to your email at midnight. And that's a really common warning sign that you're going to look for is like, are they only emailing you late at night? Um, another one, you know, Brian mentioned earlier is uh, when you look at your invoice, is it all over the place? Can you understand? Is there consistency to it? You know, uh, a great businessman that I dealt with one time, he said, hey, you know, talk to me like I'm a kindergartner and give me options like I'm choosing off the kids menu because I know that IT is all this crazy stuff. I just wanna know that I'm making a good decision, that I'm getting the information I need. So when I think about that, as a consumer of IT services, you should be able to look at your invoice and go, yep, that's, I, I get it. That's what I'm paying for and that's what I'm getting. Yeah, so those are all great common you know, pitfalls. So um, you know, again, ask, you know, how many people are in your organization? We're gonna come up with some pro tips later on. I'll, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit later. But yeah, how are you getting your communication? How are, how, how are you being invoiced? Um, those are all things. So if, you, if you're with the provider today and you say, hey, I, I, this isn't quite adding up, you, know, you may have an average MSP. So you know, our goal here is really just to inform and educate. And I'm going to add one more at the end. Um, but you know, we're going to talk about some different uh, roles and responsibilities that a world-class provider uh, should have in place. So. Um, so Justin, I think, do you want to talk about our service tools? Uh, I know we're going to tag team some of these a little bit. Here. Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. So service tools, you know, the, these are the tools that are used day to day to support, you know, your network and your business. You know, these are things like antivirus software and of course, Windows updates and uh, print management, and, you know, your backups, your spam filtering, you know, the ability to track the maintenance request and provide metrics to you on how quickly they're responding to things and how often tickets are sitting and how many escalations need to be done you know how many tickets come in or how many requests come in that have to be escalated to a higher level of support um, you know the service tool set you know there, there's a lot of bright shiny objects out there uh, in IT and I think a mature MSP uh, you know has aligned themselves with best of breed products and of course you know, there's a lot of products that do a lot of things, and uh, there's a lot of opinions out there in IT, but standardizing on something, uh, you know, is, is really important. And it, it, it uh, you know, having uh, an MSP that is dedicated to standardizing environments across all of their clients is, is going to also be a key to maturity. Um, you know, of course, we, we can't, you know, we, it, people never call us, like I said earlier, and said everything's working great, come take over. Um, you know, a good or a great MSP is looking to move clients in accordance with a standard, uh, you know, because it's that standard that creates the outcome. You know, if, yes. if the MSP is trying to support anything and everything and be all things to all people, it's going to be really difficult for them to deliver that outcome because they're going to always be switching gears. They're never going to have a standard. Um, you know, whenever I go and do a sale and people are asking me what tools that we use, um, you know, I, I will talk about the tools, but really what I try to do is refocus the conversation on the outcome that those tools deliver and the dedication to the standard that the business has, their, their sort of 
um, you know, their, their stance towards those standards is really important because it is those standards that deliver the outcome. Yeah. Um, standardizing the tools is really, really important for an MSP to be able to deliver the outcome in a consistent way. Um, and I, I oftentimes I'll say that, you know, it doesn't really matter, you know, what the tools are, like what the individual products that they're using, you know, because that's the flour and the sugar uh, to their, to their uh, chocolate cake that they sell. You know, when, when, when Luke and I uh, go out on sales, we talk about that chocolate cake that, you know, we sell a chocolate cake that we know if you follow this recipe, you're going to have a delicious chocolate cake every time. But if we're trying to mix the flour and the sugar and we're doing different ingredients every time, you know, it's going to be much harder to deliver that, that result. So tools are really important, making sure that, that your, your um, MSP, that your, your provider is standardizing on certain tools um, is really, really an important thing. Another really common one that we get asked a lot, and it's kind of, you know, a slippery bowling ball, if you will. It's, it's hard to really grasp what people say, well, what's your SLA? as if that means something. When's the last time that you didn't get a response for any service where you actually went and pulled out an SLA and held it up to the person providing service and said, see, I should be getting a response by this time. At that point, we've already failed. So the more important question would be to ask the provider, what do you think is great customer service and great response times and how do you measure and make that happen? And understanding their answer is going to tell you what you're actually going to get on a regular basis. Because guess what? An SLA doesn't mean anything. It's just on a piece of paper. But what actually happens on a day to day, how that organization measures that successful outcome and what the culture and the spirit of their customer service is, is going to be what you get. That is, I mean, paramount, really. Um, you know, how do you measure your success? You know, what is success? That is a fantastic question to ask. Uh, anybody that you're talking to to possibly do service for you is how do you measure your success? Um, and, you know, for our service tools, a ticketing system, you know, a way to, to track responses and a way to produce metrics on those responses and, uh, you know, measure uh, your customer service and your uh, customer satisfaction surveys, you know, is really an important part of, of the tool set that, a, that an MSP offers you. But the most important thing is the spirit of it. How do you measure success? What does success look like? to that particular, uh, you know, partner or that particular company. I love it. And, you know, so two key things I took away from that conversation, you know, are really standardization mm -hmm. equals efficiency. Um, and then what does success look like? Um, and only you can really answer that question. Uh, you know, but I think if we arm you with the right questions to ask, um, you'll be prepared to have that conversation. So, um, yeah, so like, so one, one, here's a one pitfall that we talk about too, and we really haven't talked a lot about backups, but that's typically something that's included in a, a, some sort of monthly recurring fee. Um, you know, one of the questions you may want to ask are backups uh, local uh, and or offsite. Um, those, do, do those things play a part in your disaster recovery planning? Uh, we're going to talk about, you know, what does that conversation look like later? Um, but, but great questions to ask. Uh, well, and the, ticket system, backups, go ahead. I was just going to say that, that backup is huge. I mean, if, I would say nine out of 10 businesses that I talk to about IT services, I'll ask that question. You know, what do you guys have going on today for backups? And it's normally, yeah, yeah, we have backups. <laughs> Do they do work? Any, do you have any idea more than that? And, and it, yeah. I'm not trying to be funny. The answer is normally no. A business owner who has worked to build a business, which we know is hard. Entrepreneurship's hard. They build a business. They get staff. They have payroll. They have insurance. They have all this stuff going on. But their most critical thing, their business data, they don't even know how it's being backed up. So that's a really important one to ask when you're interviewing somebody. What do you guys do for backups? How does it work? help me understand so that you're making an informed decision because if you don't understand what you're buying how in the world can you agree to a price absolutely that's great that's great so uh, so i think that the next couple slides so we talked about what is a managed services provider what are some common offerings what makes uh, a, an average a good to great provider what are some of the tools that they would use um you know now we're really going to focus on the different roles and responsibilities of a world-class provider. These are kind of just some very important um, departments, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, that, that a mature organization uh, would have. Um, so first we're going to talk about uh, what is a service desk. Um, 
So, so Justin and Luke, what? Uh, let's let's do this. What is a not a service desk? That would be a way. What is not a service desk? Well, a service desk is not somebody that you're calling that's uh, you know you're that's answering their cell phone. You know, it's not texting you know a tech and getting an answer through text message. It's not you know a cell phone number of somebody in the company that you can call whenever you have a problem. Like that is not a service desk. Um, you know, that's just very uh, uh, not well defined. You know, service desk is a dedicated team of individuals that is responding to uh, you know day to day support requests. Um, you know, typically they're going to be, you know, working remote. Um, they're going to be a team of people. It's not just one person or two people that you call. Um, you know, it's going to be uh, a place that has a deep bench of, of technology experience, yeah. you know, somebody that has different levels of support. You know, your level one people to do your password resets and your drive mappings and your printer installs, level two to do the more, you know, networking related tasks, and then an escalation procedure, you know, within that department in order to make sure that, you know, tickets are getting, uh, you know, resolved and addressed in a, in a timely fashion. And that if, if level one can't get to it, that they have a stop gap that says, hey, you know, if we haven't resolved it in an hour, it goes to the next level. A disciplined, you know, system and process around how do we handle day-to-day -day support. And typically that's going to be a team of people, not just somebody that you're calling, you know, on their cell phone or somebody that you're, you know, you're text messaging, uh, you know, during the day. Yeah. I, I think of, you know, uh, how, how many of us have had that experience, you know, maybe um, calling into your internet provider or mm -hmm. to your cable guy and like, Hey, well, well, did you reboot, you know, your, your, your top box? Like, yes. A million times, you know, um, th there's always this dreaded fear, um, you know, and that's what we do not want. Um, you know, we want to be able to, to swiftly and uh, accurately assess the problem and, and fix it. So, yeah, and, absolutely. And, and, and we go back to something that we <laughs> talked about on the previous slide, which is measuring success. You know, a good service desk or a service desk is going to be able to measure, you know, what does it look like, uh, you know, to submit a ticket with them? What is the average response time? How many tickets are escalated? You know, they're going to have a, a software system that they're disciplined to use mm -hmm. to track all of these requests and to make sure things are getting addressed in a timely ma manner. Yeah. And often there will be a manager of this department that is yeah. that is responsible for reviewing these metrics and measuring success, you know, for that team. Um, you know, I, that can't be understated is measuring success and defining what success looks like. And, and back to red flags to look for it. If you've got a managed services provider that's, you know, owner, is the lead engineer, the salesperson, the purchasing guy, uh, the escalations guy, uh, the HR guy, the payroll guy. That's common. That's what you typically find. So how does that guy have time amongst all those other things to then go out and spend the time to research and develop a software to measure his own success? Like that in itself is a huge investment internally to understand those things. So the very simple question that can get to the bottom of all of that is when you're interviewing somebody and say, what is your average time to resolution for your individual tickets and how do you know? Yeah. And if they can answer that for you, then you're gaining value out of that because then you know that that's going to correlate to what the typical expected outcome is going to be. If they can't answer it, you're taking a crapshoot as to what your customer service delivery is going to be like. Yeah. Well, <laughs> go ahead. I would say the, the other one we get to is, you know, uh, well, when we call, will someone answer the phone? That blows my <laughs> mind. Of course, someone will answer the phone, you know, and that's, again, back to maturity. Like, is it just a main line and a couple of phones on desks or is it actually a call center with metrics and agent status and over overflow processes and things that ensure that when you call, you get through to the right person? can't manage what you don't measure. And if they're not measuring it and they can't tell you how they're measuring success, then, then you're probably not talking to the right provider. Absolutely, absolutely, all right. Well, uh, so, so that was a, a good, you know, one of the roles, um, uh, one of the five roles is uh, service desk. Um, so let's talk about um, what we call network administration. Um, you know, so this is an, an area of, of focus um, that, Really, it's, it's a, it leans more on the proactive side. Um, so, you know, service desk, the previous slide, is, is, is that reactive side, right? Uh, that's when something's broke, you need to call in to have something fixed. Um, the remaining categories are going to be weighted more on that proactive um, outcome. Um, so this is a, a specific role um, that is, is a little bit different than, say, an on-site reactive um, person. 
Um, but really this role is filled by a skilled network administrator who, whose sole purpose is to really, you know, come on site. Uh, this can also be done remotely. Um, you know, there's certain things that we definitely want to make sure we check on site. You know, we want to make sure we're looking at all the components, make sure we're not seeing any, you know, red flashing items or buzzing beeping sounds. Um, but, you know, we want to come on site, evaluate that network, um, and, and basically put it to a test of best practices. So, mm -hmm. so a very mature um, operation would would have a, a standard that, right, we talked about that earlier, right, standard equals efficiency, um, process equals maturity. Um, so we want to take, you know, the current environment of that customer and match them to the operational efficiencies. Mm -hmm. um, and when those two don't line up, we, we have what we call a misalignment. Um, so it's the network administrator's job is to really review the technical role um, uh, or the, the technical efficiencies of that standard and say, hey, is there alignment? Do we line up or does it not match? Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, and we're going to talk about this kind of in the, in the next slide, um, it's the network administrator's goal is to really just make a technical assessment. Is this switch turned on or is it turned off? Um, very, you know, um, there is no gray area, maybe is a better way of saying it. It's, it's something that's on or it's off. Um, and so it's his job to make a technical recommendation if something is turned off or improperly turned on. Um, so they look to see what uh, best practices are implemented um, and then take that to, I think what our next slide is gonna talk about is a technology consultant. You know, a great uh, analogy for this would be to think about you, know, you got all that reactive stuff and that network engineer is really that person who's dedicated taking the time to get into that hairy scary stuff and so analogy i use is like uh, i love fishing and so uh, i bought a boat one time and when i bought that boat i bought it from another person and when i went to go buy that boat from that person i went to their house and that person opened their garage and when they opened their garage every single tool was labeled and hanging in the appropriate place, I, I, my mind was blown. I couldn't, I, I couldn't believe the organizational level, the time that person took to put everything in the right place. So what did that give me mentally? In, incredible confidence that this boat I was purchasing had been maintained and taken care of properly. So you can think of the network administrator as that guy who's not just out there fighting fires, but the guy who's making sure every tool's in the right place, every system is in place so that when we go to deliver an outcome, that it's gonna be successful. Absolutely, absolutely. So the network administration role works very closely uh, in hand uh, with this technology uh, consultant. Um, so you may hear some different phrases um, in this uh, virtual um, chief information officer or VCIO. Um, but really, what does that mean? It's, it's a fancy term for technology consultant. Um, typically, someone who fills this role is, is a um, a technical account manager who, who understands the engineering side of um, someone who can interpret those technical yes or no's, but then transform that information into how does it relate to your business? Um, what risk does uh, this switch being turned on or off? What does that really mean? How can I assess that from a business, business perspective? Um, and so that's the role of the technology consultant. Uh, is to really understand how you work uh, as a business um, so that you can, you know, plan and strategize for, you know, growth um, or, right, a, a global pandemic. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so those are things that, that I would typically talk to our customers about is, you know, well, what about remote access? Uh, all the things that we uncovered, you know, how, how, how do you meet with people if you're not, uh, if you're spread out throughout the state or throughout the country? Mm -hmm. Well, and in your role as a technical business advisor, you know, you can think of it a lot like a financial advisor. You wouldn't hire a financial advisor if you didn't believe they genuinely cared about your best interest and your outcome. And that's what a, a business advisor does in the technological world. They're going to be invested in the relationship with you, care about your business, understand your business, and help match up those solutions with your business so that not only do you continue your existing growth strategy, but you're fully prepared for whatever the world might throw, the pandemic, uh, another event in the future where maybe there's, you know, need to go disperse mobile again. All of that would be covered yeah. by a business advisor. And I think another another key component is the ability to translate that tech 
that the, maybe the network administrators are interpreting those, those yes, no's, those standards and technologies into business results and outcomes and, and having the conversation with executive leadership, you know, with the managers about, uh, you know, how the technology impacts the business. You know, I mean, let's face it, and I can kind of speak for myself. Sometimes it's difficult for engineers to translate, you know, technical folks to translate uh, you know, into business value or into business outcomes. And that technology consultant can kind of straddle both roles, can play, you know, the technical per, uh, technical uh, role and then also translate that for leadership into, you know, business outcomes and into metrics. You know, why are we doing this? You know, why are we asking if your switch firmware is up to date? Why are we asking if your firewall is within a certain age? You know, what's the business reason for doing that? Not just technology for the sake of technology, the technology for the sake of you know improving your business and, and implementing best practices so that we can enable your business to be ready for things like a global pandemic or a, a failure of your server room air conditioner or a fire flood um, you know uh, personnel having to be out you know remote access to your network uh, uh, any number of things they're trying to translate a best practice into an outcome or into a reason why a business might might do that particular action. I love yeah. your I love your analogy that you give, Justin, about uh, you don't want the villagers at your door with pitchforks. Right. Uh, and so back to what he was just saying, it's when you help a business owner understand why something's happening, like a compliance change or a significant change in a software or, or how we're going to access our servers. Those changes are going to have massive impacts to your end users, probably going to be inconvenient, adding like two factor authentication, for example. Everyone tomorrow, you now have to use your cell phone to hit a button to log into your computer. Oh, I can't believe it. Now you've got the villagers at your door. But if that conversation has been had and you've helped them understand the value and the outcome, and then you've enabled that business owner to then take that message clearly to their team and say, hey, we have change coming and here's why and here's how it's going to benefit the business. Now you've paved the way for a smooth takeoff into that transition and you've got smiles on faces instead of villagers yeah. at your door with pitchforks. Yeah, and oftentimes the success or failure of a technology within a business has nothing to do with the technology itself but how the, the level of buy-in that leadership has and the, the sort of uh, communication down to the end users about that technology, like the why behind it, uh, really helps an employee uh, to, to adapt to it and understand why something's happening instead of looking at it as IT is making their life more difficult, you know, coming down from leadership and having that conversation, you know, having leadership talk to a technology consultant and translate the why so that they can then explain it to their staff so that we can get buy-in. Oftentimes a success or failure of a project or a technology implementation has to do with that level of communication and the technology consultant helps with that. Absolutely. So, you know, if I have to take away a couple things, you know, it's, you know, we're going to implement tools um, that help us budget and plan uh, that will eventually help us mitigate any risk or reduce that unexpected cost. Uh, so that kind of goes back to the analogy we talked about, you know, having the air conditioner go out in the middle of summer versus the water heater. You know, things are going to go wrong, but we want to make sure that it's just more of a minor inconvenience or that we plan for multi-factor authentication and compliance changes. Uh, and I'll kind of close on, on that before we move to the next slide about automated services. You know, um, this is other one thing, uh, and Justin kind of touched on, you know, the compliance side of it, but that's a whole nother sec. And so uh, we have uh, customers that work with the Department of Defense. So there's there's these different security uh, or, or healthcare providers with HIPAA requirements or regulations. Um, so those are things that we can work together, you know, making sure that the, uh, not only the end users, but, you know, the decision makers know these are changes that are happening. These are why we need to make these changes um, so that, you know, again, uh, you guys can thrive. And that's what I think the ultimate goal is. So what, what are what are automated services? You know, another, another way that you can uh, talk about this is centralized services. That's another really popular sort of term in our industry. But really what we're talking about uh, is going back to those dedicated roles and responsibilities that we mentioned earlier. You know, this is a team of individuals that manages the tools that uh, are used to support and to standardize your environment. These are things like, how do we patch and install security updates, you know, on your servers? How do we monitor, um, you know, some of you might seen in the news recently about the uh, vulnerability that Microsoft had in their mail, uh, their mail server platform, Microsoft Exchange. Um, that, that caused a lot of uh, strife for a lot of IT folks. You know, these are the people that would identify, you know, what customers need to be patched and then go out and do that. 
and that and it's a dedicated job role. You know, again, going back to dedicated roles and responsibilities, this is a team of people that just does that. You know, they are in charge of managing the automated tool sets, uh, the patching, the antivirus software, the spam filtering, anything that we can control at a central level. Um, you know, this team is dedicated to uh, to supporting. You know, they're monitoring your environments. They're reading the monitoring uh, tools that come in that say, hey, you know, free space on this server is bad or this backup didn't run. Uh, you know, they are in charge of managing all of that. And, and again, if it's everyone's responsibility in a company, it's no one's responsibility. So, you know, these, uh, these team members are responsible for backups and dedicated to these roles. Uh, and it's, it's, I think this is really one of those key roles that help a company like ours, a managed services provider, to become more efficient with what they do. Um, you know, they're automating things. Like maybe the service desk finds, hey, you know, accounting is always having this trouble when they come in every Thursday, this ticket is being submitted because their software isn't doing X, Y, Z, the reports aren't running or the, you know, the emails aren't going out properly. The automated services team or the central services team can implement, uh, you know, automation tools to prevent those, those issues from reoccurring. Um, so that the service desk doesn't have to deal with that reactive problem coming in. Uh, and so they're, they're, they're driving efficiency. This, this whole team is around making the other teams more efficient at what they're doing. And it's a key component, in my opinion, to a successful managed service provider is, uh, do they have this role in their company? You know, how many people are in this role and uh, are they dedicated? Do these people do anything else besides this? Um, it's, it's certainly one of our keys to success in our business. Absolutely, and very well said. So let's talk about uh, kind of the, the next pillar. So I think we've talked about four roles, right? Uh, one of which was reactive. The other three are proactive, uh, and this is kind of that, that fifth uh, proactive um, pillar, which is uh, professional services. Um, so uh, this is just more of a, of a coin phrase that you uh, may hear that indicates uh, a department that's specifically designed for projects or what we call non-recurring services. This is that one-time fee uh, that I was referring to earlier. Uh, something that falls outside of that monthly recurring cost, uh, because there's going to be some sort of new technology that, that is going to be implemented to solve a specific problem um, or to upgrade, you know, from an existing. Um, so typical things, what are professional services? They're, they're dedicated engineering resources. Um, you know, as, as Justin mentioned earlier with like a, a service desk, you really want some sort of a, a project management office. You want someone, uh, again, very process driven, um, you know, to have things like kickoff calls. Um, you want, you know, a, a department to be able to work with the sales team or that technology consultant to understand, you know, what is the expected outcome uh, that was talked about with the customer? What are we really trying to achieve here? Um, so you want someone kind of spearheading those conversations you know, for you. Um, it's a team of highly skilled um, engineers, right? Um, they have years of, of experience and big beards. Uh, these are the guys that, that you want implementing your technology. Um, so, uh, you know, so again, as mentioned, um, you know, these are more larger time intensive tasks. Um, some examples of that would be like a server upgrade, um, uh, I know, I think our very first webinar was about Office 365 and some cloud services. Mm -hmm. These are the guys, uh, if you haven't listened to that webinar, go back, uh, if everything's being recorded, uh, go back and check it out. But these are the guys that are going to be, you know, turning uh, those solutions on for you. Um, like I said, key things to look out for is making sure that you have a dedicated uh, project management office. Um, I, I don't know, running, anything I, else to add to that? I, I was going to say, I know we're running a little bit short on yeah. time, so we're probably going to power through these next couple of slides at a, at a quicker pace because we got a couple of questions to get to at the end. We want to make sure we Perfect. save five minutes for that. So Yeah, um, let's do that. Let's do that. So we'll, we'll dive into some additional roles and support um, and everything that has been leading up to this point. These are really those questions to ask as you're shopping and looking and thinking. Um, but in, in larger you know, MSPs, things that you'll find that are unique are going to be roles like a solutions architect. Someone dedicated to digging in, understanding all the details of any given project, and then writing a very clear deliverable and scope of work. 
you know, in any technological project, you know, the reason that the project management office is so important is because there's so many details. There's, there's communication, there's planning, there's potentially contractors involved, there's license purchasing and provision, there's tenant provision and Azure, there's all kinds of stuff that goes on to make sure that the day one of the next day after the project that the outcome is ready for use. Uh, so somebody who's dedicated to describing all of that, writing it all out, and then delivering that quote proposal. Accounting, this is so understated in IT. I can't tell you the number of times that we get uh, feedback about, oh, I get invoiced for this, and then I don't know what that's for, and why does it take 26 hours to reset someone's password? An accounting team that is proficient and has experience, they're going to deliver consistency to you. You're going to get a clear invoice. You're going to know exactly why. And if you have questions, you'll have somebody to call the accounting department. Um, procurement, again, understated. When you go to buy a laptop, there's 5,000 options out there. Do I have the right RAM, the right memory, the right video card, the right number of ports? What type of ports? All of that needs to be considered. So a procurement department is making sure they're buying through distribution, they're making sure your warranties are registered, all of that good stuff. And then a bench technician, you know, stuff breaks. So when you've got stuff that breaks, have you, I don't know, I've never been through it personally, but going through like a warranty process with, with any major provider, you know, it's that, have you turned it off and on again? Uh, can you send it back yeah, to check us? The we'll, boxes, yeah, yeah, we'll do a diagnosis <laughs> and then we'll send, it's just, it's a pain, but nine times out of 10, it's something that could be easy, easily fixed if there's a bench technician who can take it in, do some basic diagnostic, get it fixed and get it back into service for you. Um, so these are some of those roles that you'll, you'll look for in one of those world-class MSPs like we're talking about, they'll have these roles in place in the organization. Um, let's go ahead and go on to the next slide here. Um, so questions to ask. Uh, we're going to just go down these very quickly here. So proactive versus reactive. You know, ask, what are you guys doing as an MSP that you would say promotes being proactive? And then when it comes to the reactive, again, what is the customer service uh, outcome like and how do you manage it? Um, do you have a dedicated project manager? Where is the support desk located? Is it, you know, are you calling out and it's going to a third party? Or is it actually the same people working on, on the same knowledge base? Um, how do I know my data is safe? Back to that backup conversation. Ask, pry, you know, you wanna know, like if you're buying a house, you wanna know all the details about the cupboards and the, the colors and this, that, and the other. So when it comes to your backups, ask, inquire, try to understand. Um, ask how many people are on the team. That's a really easy one. Hey, how many people are in your organization? That right there is gonna give you an idea where if you look at what's on their sales sheet, Hey, we offer 17 departments of service. How many people do you have? Four. How's that gonna be delivered? Red flag. Uh, big red flag. Um, and then again, what's that average response time and why? Uh, and do they offer budget and IT strategy meetings? Is there a Brian? If there isn't a Brian, you're in big trouble. You need a business advisor who cares about your business, cares about understanding what's going on uh, and is part of developing solutions for you. And in all of that, the beauty of what happens is that Second or third slide where we said, hey, the difference between an average MSP and a world class is that they're more expensive. But when you're getting all this value and all these elements are baked in, that price changes from a cost to an investment. And now your technology is part of your business growth and your business strategy. And you look at those invoices that you're getting, hopefully from the accounting department, and you're happy about what you're paying for and the service that you're getting. Uh, sorry for like, lightning speed through that slide. I know we have a couple of questions to get to. You guys have any uh, thoughts to add to this one? No, I, I think you, you, you said it well. Um, you know, uh, just real quick, you know, asking where the support desk is located, you know, don't be afraid to take a tour. Look at the brick and mortar. Yes. Um, you know, that will often just visually seeing um, is, is very helpful um, and it'll help you prepare. And I have one last thing I'd like to add is, is one of my biggest pro tips is does that organization's culture fit your culture? Mm. You know, are they a, a good fit for you? And that's only something that you can know. You know, what, what is the culture fit between the two organizations? And, that, and that's really paramount. You know, you want a, a partner that can relate with you, that can talk with you, you know, as a business owner or as a, as a manager and understands your business and, and can talk your language and can really relate with you. And, and having that culture fit between the two companies is really key. And it's, it's something that when, when we go out and do sales that we spend a lot of time talking about is that culture fit. Because if, if we're not a good culture fit for you, it doesn't matter how we're doing it. Um, you know, if we don't fit your company culture, then it's probably not gonna be a success. Absolutely.
let's breeze through this next slide because candidly, this entire presentation has been a shameless plug. Because all, <laughs> all these things that we talked about, really, it, you know, we're speaking from experience of how we have grinded and, and sweated and bled through the years to build our organization to look like all the things that we've just discussed. And it's not easy. It takes a lot of time, a lot of headaches, and a lot of effort. Um, but once you get there, you're able to enjoy those, those benefits. Um, so we do all those things. We are the IT department as a service uh, to those clients that we have the honor of serving as their technology partner. Um, so we're going to jump into some questions here. Uh, I saw Catherine. She asked a really interesting question slash statement. So the why is important. You know, people don't engage in implementation until there's a big problem or an explosion. Um, so my response to this would be, Go to whomever the decision-making body is and, and, and ask if they'd be willing to discuss what is the cost of our average hour of business downtime. And that can kind of be the tip of the funnel question that leads into exploring all the other details. Because, you know, for those of us who are on the, the ground floor of any business, we're in the details. We care about the details and we want to fix the details. But normally, you know, the decision-makers, they don't want to dive into it unless they think it's important. So if you can ask that simple question. What's the cost? of an hour of our business downtime and get that answer, that can sometimes be you know, a flower that blooms into a bigger conversation. Um, I'm not familiar with uh, the FTC.gov uh, small business. Anybody else that, uh, I'll have to check out that website, Catherine, not familiar. Um, and then let's see, Justin, why yeah, I got the next one. For so when considering network solutions, what suggestions do you have uh, for managing multiple remote locations? And this kind of goes back to the, uh, to the tool set, um, you know, that we talked about is, is having a mature tool set. You know, we have a software platform that, uh, you know, essentially installs a, a small piece of software on each computer that we manage. And it doesn't matter where they're at. Um, you know, I want to say Luke was supporting somebody over the weekend that was in Greece. Um, so it doesn't really matter, you know, where these computers exist, as long as they have that software tool set installed, you know, we're able to remote control in, we're able to run reports, we're able to, um, you know, remote into their site. So I would say, you know, what suggestions do we have for managing remote sites, you know, is, is make sure that you have a tool that is, uh, uh, you know, that is there that enables you to do that. Other tools, things like, uh, um, you know, when we have, um, you know, we've got locations all over the United States and even abroad, you know, we'll sell a uh, little power strip that can be controlled over the internet that can power cycle things. Um, you know, if if your modem doesn't respond to a ping, you know, automatically, you know, reset the modem for you. And, and these things can be put into place so that, you know, people don't have to go around and unplug and plug things when needed. Um, you know, they can be automated and done over the internet. Also, lights out management. Um, you know, all the servers that we sell and all the equipment that we sell and support will have the ability to be managed, and it might sound silly, but the, the, the ability to be managed when it's not powered on. Uh, and that's, that's called lights out management. Uh, HP calls it ILO or intelligent lights out, but it, it describes the ability to be able to get into something if it's not necessarily on and turn it on or reboot it or, or change a setting at the, you know, at the lower level um, that you would not normally be able to get to until you know the system's all the way uh, you know booted up, as it were. And, and Justin, if I can just add, and I don't know how many other questions we have, but uh, I would also encourage um, you know, go back and check out the Office 365 mm -hmm. and the Azure Cloud Services yes. webinar as well. Um, you know, I know that the, the specific question was how do you manage remote locations, but that first webinar about cloud services can maybe help you uh, understand how you can leverage cloud services for That's remote and multiple locations. Really a fantastic point. You know, if your business is focused in in the cloud and we, we've adopted a cloud first mentality so that when we're, we're making recommendations, we're always thinking cloud first. And it's for some of these reasons, uh, you know, managing a remote location can be a challenge, but when you centralize all your services uh, in, in the cloud, you can manage it from the cloud. Uh, meaning you don't need access to that remote site. You know, you can manage the site, you know, from one central location, despite, you know, where it might be, you know, physically. Yeah, and you remove a lot of, you know, operational costs as well, you know, power consumption, I mean, internet services, you know, mm -hmm. when you put things in the cloud, some of those, uh, it alleviates some of the risk there for you as well. You guys ready for the bad dad joke of the morning? Uh -oh. oh, goodness. Cloud strategies precipitate successful business outcomes. Oh, precipitate. Uh, okay. Uh, on that terrible joke and note, um, I do want to uh, wrap up by handing it over to Deborah Gittins. She's got a couple of uh, thoughts for us before we wrap up. Thank you guys so much for allowing us the opportunity to share. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you, gentlemen. For those of you who haven't 
seen the entire series with these guys, you have missed a lot. It has been phenomenal and extremely educational. I do wanna let everybody know that we are starting to take a survey on these workshops and it will be coming into your inbox at the end of uh, the day, before the day is over today. And it's extremely important that you reply for us, primarily because these are federally funded programs and it will allow us to continue to get funds to promote these types of events. And I really, really hope that we're able to bring these gentlemen back in the future because it was extremely valuable. I'm one of those that learned the hard way about not having hiring the right IT professional. And it is a costly process when you don't do that. Um, again, all of these videos, we have now a YouTube channel, which I'm really excited about. So that if you anybody has missed anything or if you wanna go over something, uh, all of our programs are now on our WBC Women's Business Center uh, YouTube channel and uh, so that you can replay it and make notes from viewing those videos. Again, thank you, gentlemen. It's just been phenomenal. It's our pleasure. Our thank pleasure you so much. Sure. Have a great week and a great Easter. Yes. Take care, Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye.